G'day Steve Timms, how are you doing? Good. Uh, what are you working on today? Um, I'm analysing some data that we took a couple of weeks ago, which is uh, of some sediment that was collected from a uh, lake in China. Um, a lake in China? Yes. You're doing nuclear physics on a lake in China? Yes, we're doing it because uh, we're investigating different ways to assess uh, erosion and yeah. the sediment gets into the lake from erosion. So who knew nuclear physicists could study erosion? That's amazing. Uh, and yeah. What was the exact experiment you did here? So we um, took a sediment core from Goyu Lake um, yep. and then divided it up into sections. Yep. And then we take each section and we process it with some chemistry to extract out um, uranium, americium and plutonium. Right. And so they're, they're all radioactive? They're all radioactive elements that are very rare and these particular isotopes are a product of the nuclear weapons atmospheric testing programs that were carried out in the 1950s and 1960s. So we're using fallout from weapons testing to study erosion. That's correct. That's pretty cool. And what, but what was the actual experiment you did here? A mass spectrometry? It's an accelerator mass spectrometry is what we do yep. here. Okay. Um, and what we do is after separating out the americium, the uh, uranium and the plutonium from yep. the sediment samples, we put them in the accelerator and we use the accelerator basically as a large atom counter. So we right. count atoms of particular isotopes, in this case yep. uranium-236, plutonium-239-240 okay. and americium-241. The s system is set up as a filter to filter out things that are not those atoms and so all we count is the ones we're interested in. Okay, so how does that tell you about erosion? Okay, so the atoms come from, as I said, the nuclear weapons testing. So when uh, a weapon explodes, um, there are, these atoms are thrown in, up into the atmosphere um, and if it was a large enough test they get right up into the stratosphere mm. and um, there they spend about one and a half years to two years um, or several years uh, mixing but eventually the uh, atoms do fall back into the um, troposphere where they get washed out with rain and then once they hit the surface of the terrestrial surface, they attach very strongly to soil particles and so yep. they act as a marker of that soil being on the surface when right. those atoms fell back down to ground. So that was back in the 1950s and 60s. Uh -huh. and so everything that was on the surface in the 1950s and 60s got this very small amount of these radioactive isotopes attached to the soil and then when that soil moves and becomes sediment in the lakes, it's yep. still stuck to it and that's what we can So when count. you take a core, you can sort of work your way down and go, bingo, that's where there's a whole lot of... Yep, that's not What was it? Uranium-236? That's correct, yep. So if there's a big... There's big, a peak in the concentration. That's, yeah, that's that at, at what sort of depth? A couple of centimetres um, or...? Well, it depends on what the sedimentation rate in the lake yeah. is. Um, in this case, it's at about 30 centimetres, but some rate... 30 seven. centimetres. So that's how far things have gone in 40, 50 years, that's or right. how much has built up. Yep. Right, okay. How far back do you go, actually? Well, you can only go back with this until yeah. the early um, 1950s. Yep. Um, the, before then, there wasn't any of these isotopes around because they're all... Right produced in the weapons test. So this is this is knowledge that's ultimately going to be used by soil scientists or by geographers or? Uh, it's used by a whole range of things because this um, sedimentation is important. Uh, part of the catchment we're doing is, is, is to try to get a baseline, but the goal is to look at sedimentation in say the Yangtze River where the Three Gorges right. Dam is already building yep. up large amounts of sediment. Ah, I see. And so it's of interest to people building dams because they want to yep. know how quickly the sediment comes in. Uh, it's also, the Chinese are very interested in it because most of Shanghai is built on sediment from the Yangtze River. Uh -huh. And so if that um, flow of sediment is changing at all, then their building um, infrastructure is subject to risk. If ocean levels change, it washes yep. it out. So there's a balance of sediment being coming down with the river and yep. what's being washed away by the ocean. Uh, and if that balance changes, they can lose their all their right. buildings. So you ultimately going to be doing cores from all over the place? Um, we will do, well this is the first time we've ever done it in freshwater lakes. Right, the, okay. We have several lakes where we plan to go back. It's a little bit more complex than I've said because um, although some fallout comes from the stratosphere, some also comes from local nuclear weapons fallout. So a smaller test will not spread its material up into the stratosphere and so it yep. falls out locally. And the local, the isotopic ratios in the local test are different to those in the stratospheric fallout. Yeah. And so they make, you've got these two signals then in your fallout and so that becomes yep. quite confusing as to how yeah, the yeah, erosion yeah. rate is um, proceeding. So, so are there local nuclear so there were, tests 
done in this China. lake? Uh, not around this lake, so yeah. that's why we're starting there, but other lakes oh, we okay. are because we have to work out how far the local test material has come oh, I see. before we can start okay. right. assessing uh, the erosion. Any news yet on not what yet. you've found? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so you still, you took this, a, there we go. That's the doorbell. That's the doorbell. <laughs> that's what happens in a lab, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Somebody get the door. Um, so you took this a couple of weeks ago and you're still cranking through the data. We've run the plutonium and the uranium um, yep. um, and we haven't, we've tried to run the americium and that's failed initially but we yep. all haven't going up, have yeah. another go at that. We have uh, analysed the plutonium data but I'm yep. only just doing the, the uranium data yeah, now. Yeah, right, okay. So what happened with the americium? Why, why did it play up? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> still still well, a challenge still to, to sort into. Out, yes. Yeah, right, okay. Possibly something in the chemistry the, in the extracting the americium from the samples but I'm not certain yet. Right, okay. So you have to be a chemist, yes, uh, a, a sediment scientist, a uh, <laughs> and a physicist, a physicist yes. all at once. Yes, sounds pretty complicated. Yes, <laughs> keeps you on your toes though. That's correct. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Steve. Welcome, Phil. Okay. So one of the difficulties with measuring heavy isotopes like uranium and plutonium and americium with a uh, accelerator mass spectrometry system is that we're trying to differentiate them on the basis of their math, mass. Yep. And the percentage difference between uranium-236 and natural uranium-235 and natural uranium-238 is not very much. So it's very right. hard to distinguish between them. That's less than a percent. Yes. Right. So we have to uh, have a, a, a unique kind of detection arrangement uh, which yep. we've developed here. Um, and what we do is um, the particles come from the accelerator with the same energy, but that means their velocities are slightly different because the right. ma uh, energies are half mv squared. And so yep. if the mass is a bit different, then the velocity is going to be a little bit different. That's kinetic energy formula, kids. Um, so um, we have a what we call a time of flight system where we measure uh, as, uh, as the iron passes one point, we produce a signal and then when it passes another point right. about six metres further down we get another signal okay. and from that we, we know the distance between the two points so we can work out their velocities. Right. Yep. And so we then, once the ions are past the, the second point, we then collect them and we can measure their energy and we have a special detector which is divided into two parts where the energy loss um, uh, the particle, the uranium ions, lose energy as they travel through that detector and they lose uh, a certain amount of energy in the first part of the detector, detector and a certain amount in the second part of the detector. Yeah. And because these atoms are very rare, there's always going to be some kind of background interference that looks like a uranium atom, but it will right. never have the same three signals that we're uh -huh. producing with the time of flight oh, okay. and the energy right. losses in the first and second. And so these plots are, um, the top one is of the energy loss in the bottom in the first part of the detector versus the energy loss in the second half of the detector and these are uranium-236 ions and they all occur in a, in a nice little bunch here yeah. um, and there's another little bunch down here which is an artificial signal that we put in to make sure the electronics is working. Right. Okay. And so we uh, collect all these ions and at the same time... So we, each spot is, is, a, a, is, is a single ion. Is a single atom, yep. Single atom. And so, you know, it looks like you've got a couple of hundred there, is it? Uh, there's about 3,800 there. 3,800, right. Um, so um, we can know where each spot is, both in this detector and in the time of flight signal, but in both the energy losses. And so the bottom plot is um, the uh, uh, energy loss in the first so it's the same as this axis here but right. on this axis is the time of flight so there here you can see a, a group of here these correspond to uranium-233 atoms which okay. we add artificially to keep track right. of what's going on and then there's another lot, lot here that is uranium-236 atoms they're the ones we're trying to count yeah. and then there's another lot up here which are uh, natural things that are not uranium-233 but sit at about the same in the same group here, so we can't yeah. really distinguish them. So this allows yeah. us to tell some are really 236 atoms and some are not 236 right. atoms. So there's going to be 238s or something like uh, that? Or they're probably going to be know. some kind of 238 uh, that have gone through the accelerator and had some kind of charge exchange right. collision and ended up with the, the right, the, the, the right uh, energy to get round the accelerator, <laughs> but now they're really the wrong velocity and so they come in, but they're the right, close to, enough to the right mass okay. that they sneak through. Right, okay. So these are the these are the real data. That's so the real data. There. That, how many did you get? What is it? Three thousand eight hundred here. 
and we've got... Um, uh, well, they're, they're, they're counting different things. The efficiency yeah. of the um, start and stop signals oh, is okay. not as high as the efficiency of collecting them in the iron chamber at the, at the end. Right, yeah. So it, they should be counting the same thing, but they're, they're not. But we can use both signals to work out the fraction in here that is not real from the fractions that we can see that are oh, okay. not real ones and real ones and then ones that are in the spectrum. Right, so once you find there's this many 236s, do you have a, an idea of how far afield they've come from? Um, well, that, they, they will have come from the entire water catchment for, yeah. for this particular lake, which in this case is not terribly large, which is uh -huh. one of the reasons why we're doing it, because right. we're constraining the uh, signal that's coming in. So you're assuming that it's come evenly from all over? Kind um, of well, we haven't, haven't even looked at that much right. of it yet. Okay. So to work out how much of it is coming from uh, different extremes, that's where you start to use the different isotopes because they have different mobilities. mobilities. Oh wow, that's getting complicated. Yes. Right. So the lighter ones will travel further or something like that? Um, well, they, the, the degree to which they stick to the soil particles varies. Okay. So stickiness becomes an issue. Yes. Golly. Okay. It's complicated stuff. All right. We better let you get on with it. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. No worries. <laughs>